Hey guys, welcome to Unit 1, Note C. Today we're going to go over a few important classifications of matter. So matter is anything that has volume and mass. So typically, what, typically a way this is phrased in books is that it takes up space and is made of matter, basically meaning that they have mass and volume. So anything that is actually an object made of stuff is matter. It would have to have a mass, put it on a scale, it registers a certain number of grams, and it would have to take up a specified amount of space or have a volume. So there's several different categories of matter. So matter would branch off into two main ones, the first of which is called a pure substance. And now there are two different types of pure substances. So we kind of see this branching going on. We could have elements or we could have compounds. Either one would classify as a pure substance. But then we could mix together some pure substances and get something called a mixture. And there are two types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. So now let's go over what each of these things means. So starting with the two main categories, pure substance versus mixture. So a pure substance would have to have one unique type of material throughout and have its own properties. For example, hydrogen has a certain property and oxygen has a certain property, whereas water would have a different property. And those are examples of elements versus compounds. You can see how those definitive properties are unique to each pure substance. The other type of matter we might have is a mixture. And this is gonna be where there's a combination of things without a chemical bond. So probably one of the most commonly confused things is a compound versus some type of mixture. With a mixture, there's no chemical bond. For example, salt with water. You don't actually have a bond between the salt molecules and the water molecules. They just happen to be mixed together. So mixture is different than a pure substance where the salt would have a specific property, the water would have a specific property. So those definitive unique properties for each substance just happen to commingle if you have a mixture. So now let's get into the two types of pure substances, an element versus a compound. So an element would literally be the thing off of the periodic table, a literal atom, specific pure substance, super simple, the smallest particle of which we call the atom. Whereas if you take two elements or two atoms and you combine them together, you get a compound. Now compounds have to be chemically combined, unlike the mixtures. So for example, H2O, there is a bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. You write that as a formula. So if you can write a formula for multiple atoms being together, we call that a compound, not a mixture. Now let's talk about the mixtures. Mixtures could either be homogeneous or the same throughout. Homo actually meaning same, Heterogeneous, hetero actually meaning different, would have a different composition throughout. So genius kind of refers to the composition. Is it the same composition or a different composition? So some examples that kind of help with identifying homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Things that are the same throughout would be like a smoothie. If you got a strawberry banana smoothie and halfway through you decided, I don't like the strawberries, let's take them out. You couldn't reposition your straw, to get banana only, you couldn't like perform any kind of magic voodoo to get the strawberries out, like they're there. It's all mixed through, it's the same throughout. No matter where you put your straw, no matter what you do to that smoothie, you got a strawberry and banana smoothie. It's mixed, it's the same throughout, it's uniform. Identical properties throughout the entire smoothie. Whereas a heterogeneous compound would be more like your soil or potpourri, that smelly stuff they put in the bathroom. A better example I like is uh, Lucky Charms. Do you eat the marshmallows first? Do you eat the marshmallows last? The fact that you can choose is because it's heterogeneous. You can pick out the gross brown stuff versus the yummy marshmallows and eat them whenever you want. A salad would be another example. I want a tomato, I want a cucumber, I don't want any onions. I can pick around because it is heterogeneous. It's a different composition and I can pick and choose what part I want. I can decide, actually I don't want tomatoes on my salad and pick them out later because it's heterogeneous as different properties. I can see that bright red tomato and just pick it out, no problem. Whereas I couldn't do that with my strawberries. So we have homogeneous versus heterogeneous. All right, so now let's talk about two important laws. Well, they're actually very similar. The first law is called the law of conservation of matter or the law of conservation of mass. 
Whereas the second law is actually just called the law of conservation of energy. So the only difference is whether we're talking about matter versus energy. The main idea between a law of conservation is that things are saved or preserved. So the law of conservation of matter says matter cannot be created or destroyed. Whereas the law of conservation of energy would say energy cannot be created or destroyed. But it doesn't mean it can't be transformed. For example, potential energy turning into kinetic energy or wood turning into soot and ash when you burn it. So there can be a transformation, but the amount of atoms or the amount of energy would need to be consistent in the entire system. So this is our laws of conservation. Remember, laws are things that are observed, things that are factual. There's no arguing with a law. It is a factual observation that matter does not just magically disappear. Energy doesn't magically appear. It's conserved no matter what. So let's kind of ponder a question then. If it can, has to be conserved, if it can't just disappear, what's going on in this situation? I have a hot cup of coffee, absolute necessity, right? Put it on my desk in the morning. We go through class. I forget about my coffee. But then I go to drink my coffee and it's cold. So where did that heat energy go? Did it just magically disappear? Poof into thin air? Is this a violation of the law of conservation of energy? Well, no. When you pick up the hot coffee, the desk would be hot as well. You see steam being emitted from the coffee. The heat energy is just being distributed into the surroundings. So it's not a conservation of energy violation. It's simply sharing the thermal energy, that heat energy with other substances. It's transformed per se, just going from one object to another. It's not a violation of the law. You can't violate the law. There's always some explanation. Does burning a log mean that I violated the law of conservation of mass because the log isn't there anymore? Well, no, all the soot, the ash, everything that came off of the log would contain the atoms that were originally in the log that was burned. So there is never a violation of the law. You just have to figure out where did the mass go or where did the energy go? It's the law. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about atoms. So atoms make up everything, um, sometimes alone, like we do have solo atoms. Metals tend to exist as solo atoms. Um, but we can also have atoms that combine together to form something called a molecule. Um, when we talked about compounds earlier, I should have emphasized like when you have two atoms joining together, the smallest building block then is called a molecule. Um, so we have atoms and molecules coming together to make up all these different things that we call our world. So the entire periodic table actually contains 118 different types of atoms, but only some of those things occur naturally. Actually, only 91 of those things occur naturally. The other things are what we call synthetic, something that we've actually man-made, something we've produced, particle accelerators, stuff like that, in order to create these different types of elements. So we have 118 total different types, but only 91 naturally occurring. So what is an atom? Atoms are made up of three main subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons are of course found in the nucleus of the atom, which is gonna be the very, very center of the atom, where all of your mass essentially is located. Not that electrons don't have mass, they just have a negligible mass. So very small mass. So when we talk mass number later, we're focusing on protons and neutrons. The electrons have a very small mass, but they do take up a large volume, or I really should say the space between them takes up a very large volume. Electrons all have a negative charge, meaning they repel each other. So they're gonna push away from each other in what we call generally the electron cloud, which we'll get into a lot more detail on in unit two. When that happens, that electron cloud takes up a large space, but the actual electrons are so small, the volume is really just coming from the space between the electrons. Much like the actual volume of your room, it's probably mostly the air in your room. It's the space between the stuff. So atoms are mostly empty space, but the mass is all concentrated in the nucleus where you would find the protons and the neutrons. So whenever you have different arrangements of protons, neutrons, and electrons, we can relabel them. We can identify certain configurations by calling them certain atoms. So for example, if I refer to hydrogen, 
I'm referring to some kind of particle that has one proton and one electron. If I refer to helium, now I have two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. So as I change the actual number of subatomic particles, I'm changing the identity of the substance or the labeling of the substance. So we, but every atom, regardless of the type, has some number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So the actual ordering on the periodic table is actually focused on the protons. And later on, we'll talk about how you can actually change the number of electrons or the number of neutrons and still call it the same thing. We call those ions and isotopes. But if I change the number of protons, I can't call it the same thing anymore. It would actually change the identity of the substance. So the protons is the heart of what an atom is. And so that's why we order it by protons on the periodic table. So the um, atomic number per se, the number that's in the top corner of the periodic table, it's gonna tell you how many protons the substance has, and that will always be tied to what the element is. So for example here, if I have the number five, it's always gonna be called boron. If I have the number one, one proton, I'm always gonna call it hydrogen. And if I have two protons, I'm always gonna call it helium. The number of protons determines what the element is. We call that its atomic number. Last thing we're gonna talk about in note C is physical properties and uh, reactions and chemical properties and reactions. So, or not reactions, changes. Physical properties and changes, chemical reactions and changes. So first let's talk about what a physical property might be. Something that kind of describes the identity of the substance. Something you can observe without actually changing what the substance is. So I'm gonna give you some examples of both quantitative and qualitative physical properties. So you wanna start getting in the habit of thinking both number-wise and descriptor-wise. So what are some physical things that we could observe about a substance without changing its identity? We could look at a substance's mass, its volume, things we could measure, right? Also color, things we could see, like its shape. Um, anything that we can describe, like texture, density, a calculation, something that's gonna describe what the substance is without changing it, something we can see or measure. Looking at physical changes, we're gonna look at things that would change those specific properties, but again, reinforcing that we wouldn't wanna change the actual properties of the sub, I'm sorry, we wouldn't wanna change the identities of the substance. So we're gonna change the physical form, like tearing a piece of paper in half, but we don't wanna change what it is. That's all saved for the chemical side of things. Physical changes never change the identity. Physical properties don't describe changes in the identity. So this is going to have to make sure that the substance stays its own substance. So the biggest example is any type of phase change. For example, H2O is chemically combined as H2O, whether it's an ice cube or steam, or just the liquid water in between. Any phase change is considered a physical change because H2O is still H2O, regardless of how fast the particles are moving. A couple other examples grinding something up, tearing stuff up. That doesn't really change the identity of the substance, so it's considered a physical change. Another one that actually gets missed a lot is dissolving. If I take salt and I dissolve it in water, I'm not creating any kind of new bond with salt and water. I've just mixed the salt in the water. Creating a mixture does not constitute a chemical change. Remember, the chemical bond would fall under the compound as far as classification goes. So when I dissolve stuff, I'm just simply changing the physical state of it. I'm changing it um, into an aqueous solution. I'm changing um, how the particles are close to each other by introducing some other medium in between, but I'm not changing what the substance is in the first place. So dissolving is still considered a physical change. Now let's get into the chemical realm of things. So a chemical property would require a change in the identity of the substance. So in order to observe a chemical property, you have to change one thing into another. So for example, knowing how flammable something is, once I set something on fire, there's enough energy to catalyze a chemical change. So how likely that is to happen, something I can observe by setting it on fire, would be an indication of a chemical property. Really any um, indication of how reactive a substance is, how likely it is to react with one substance or another, 
is an idea of a chemical property, how something will behave chemically, how likely it is to change into a different substance or undergo a chemical change. So speaking of chemical changes, chemical changes would have to occur with an actual change to the substance's identity. The composition is altered. So we have to have a completely new product. When we start studying chemical reactions, we'll talk about reactants making different products. And those chemicals have to be different. It has to be a completely new substance where we're breaking the bonds of the reactants and forming new bonds in the product side. So some examples here. Anytime you see these, like you probably balanced chemical reactions in middle school. Anytime you see reactants, the yields arrow, products, and these things are different, when we're looking at a chemical reaction, we can see we have a chemical change. This can also be observed without actually having a given formula. If you can actually see some kind of irreversible change, you have an indication you have a chemical change. For example, the demonstration where we took the egg, which was very similar to the proteins in your eyeball, and added acid to the egg, it cooked the egg in the same way that the acid would cook your eyeball. Dangerous. Right? That's the whole reason why we want to make sure we always wear goggles. So we don't want this chemical change to impair our vision. We don't have to have a chemical formula to see that that white cooked substance is different from the original reactants. So looking at that difference in reactants versus products is a good indication that I have formed a completely new substance and that I have a chemical change. So it can be kind of tricky to actually determine do I have a new substance? Is it just steam from a physical change or is this some kind of new gas that was formed? So some indicators that we want to look for is anytime you have an open flame, it's definitely going to lean towards being a chemical change. Fire, burning things, lots of energy. You're going to have the energy necessary to break bonds and form the new bonds. And so you have these flames typically indicating some kind of chemical change. It's a red flag per se. Gas is one I just mentioned a second ago, but you do have to be careful that it's not a physical change. Maybe like the reaction when um, an Alka-Seltzer between citric acid and a baking soda, you're producing a lot of carbon dioxide, and that's what produces this vigorous bubbling. So it's an indication of a chemical change, one we're going to use as the basis of a lab later. But just seeing boiling water in a pot on the stove, that's not a chemical change. It's just water turning from liquid water into steam. So you've got to put some thought into, is this a new gas that was formed or am I doing something to just cause a phase change? So you just got to be careful with the gas given off, but a gas being given off actually can be a really good indicator of a chemical change. The other thing is sometimes the color of the reactants will be different than the color of the products. And so if you see a color change, that can be an indication that something new is formed. The idea here is we have to take something that we see with our eyes and try to make an inference about what's happening at a microscopic level. Did we form a new substance? So this really drives home the importance of connecting the macroscopic observations that we make with the microscopic inferences in the conclusions that we're gonna draw. So macroscopic, macro meaning large, means that we're gonna be able to see stuff with our own eyes. Things like the color changes or the gases, the bubbling, Microscopic, on the other hand, means small. Micro means small. And what we're trying to do here is figure out what we can't see. If it's microscopic, you can't see it with the naked eye. We would need a microscope, right? So what we're really trying to do is take the things we can see. For example, say I take a substance and I put it over a flame and I see it turn from a dark blue to a blackish looking burnt grayish thing. Well, that's an indication to me that I probably burnt it. If it looks burnt, I probably burnt it. So burning is a chemical change. And so then I could make an inference or an educated guess that I probably caused a chemical change if I had enough energy to turn it from blue to black. So we want to have evidence. We want to have a reason why we're making the inferences, but to make a conclusion, it is an inference. You just want to try to get enough data to support your inference. Macroscopic observations connecting to microscopic inferences. And that's the main point when you're doing a lab. What do you see in order to support your conclusion? All right, let's end with a couple of uh, little pop quiz questions. 
on whether you think we have a physical change or chemical change. So let's say I have my evaporating, I have this cup of coffee or tea, and it's steaming. Would this be a physical change or a chemical change? Well, all phase changes are physical changes. So this would be physical change. What about if I take a light bulb and I just smack, smack it, smash it? Would I create a new substance? Is this a chemical change or a physical change? Well, breaking stuff, the light bulb is still made of glass. You still have glass particles all over the place. Still silicon dioxide. Didn't change the identity of the substance. So again, we have a physical change. Next, I have a tea pot boiling. So what about boiling or phase change? Any phase change is a physical change. So again, it's still a physical change on this one. What about rusting? When I have something like iron and it's exposed to the air for a while and then it starts to change color and create something that looks very different from the original reactants. So is that a physical change or chemical change? This new color indicates a new product, iron oxide. So that would be a chemical change. And then what about when we have a large field on fire, these wildfires? Is this burning creating a physical change or a chemical change? Burning is always a chemical change. Whenever you have those flames, you have a chemical change. So this would be an example of a chemical change. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for unit one, note C. The next set of notes on unit one, notes D is gonna focus on the phase changes specifically, speaking of physical changes, um, and talk about the energy involved as molecules move from one phase to the other. So we'll see you there.